Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, or evening, whatever time you're watching. Uh, this is a brief lecture to go over spatial analyst and our introduction to raster processing. So uh, in the past several weeks, we've been working a lot with vector data. So we've been dealing with points, lines, and polygons. We've been thinking about how you uh, select features based on distances or based on intersection of points, lines, and polygons. We've been thinking about how you uh, use geoprocessing to create new features, for example, you know, clipping points, lines, and polygons to just a specific area or shape. Raster data are uh, completely different in many ways from vector data. So we can still do those same sort of essentially geoprocessing steps of looking for uh, overlap, so intersection or clip um, where, where two pixels overlap. We can also effectively do an erase, you know, like excluding areas uh, you know, of one raster feature, like an elevation band that's too high for a, a species to exist. Um, but instead of those sort of geoprocessing tools like intersects and erases or buffers, for example, so buffer we've done before, uh, you know, showing the shape around a vector data set to create a, a raster um, buffer is essentially a distance grid. So you have distances from features. So when we start thinking about raster data sets, so on the left, we've got an aerial photo, on the right, we've got a hill shade map, so sort of shaded relief showing a, you know, an, a, what the sun might light up um, if it's coming from a given angle over topography. When we talk about raster data sets, we are dealing with numeric data because each pixel just has a number value. And so instead of thinking about geoprocessing tools like buffers, uh, intersects, erases, we're instead dealing with um, map algebra. So essentially, you know, multiplying or adding, or I guess subtracting or dividing, but mostly multiplying and adding uh, to look for the overlap of, uh, of pixels. All right, so when we think about what information is associated with a pixel, right, remember pixels are square. This is a zoom in, so this is a Quabbin Reservoir in Western Massachusetts in a grayscale image. When you zoom way in, you start to see these individual pixels. And so when we ask what information is associated with a pixel, uh, if I clicked the Explore tool and clicked on one of these pixels, all that I would get would be a number. So typically, if in this case, we're looking at a reflectance image, so essentially the darker areas are reflecting less light because water doesn't absorb pretty well, doesn't reflect a lot of light, and the land is reflecting more light. Uh, so if I clicked on you know, the value of one of these black pixels, I would get a really low value. If I clicked on a white pixel, I would get a higher value, um, but it's just gonna be a number. And those numbers could be integers, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3. They could be floating point, 3.14. <laughs> uh, and they could go from, you know, they could just be zeros and ones. They could be uh, 0 to 255. If that's, you know, integer 0 to 255 is a common data format called 8-bit. Um, we could go to more bits. <laughs> Uh, 1632, so that we can get to the point where we have, you know, integers to the millions. Um, we can go even more so that we can capture floating point data. But ultimately, the key point is that when you click on any of these pixels, all that you get is a number. Here's that same image uh, of the Quabbin Reservoir in a this is false color. Um, we're going to talk about remote sensing next week. Uh, but in this case, we're dealing with color. So they're actually, uh, if you were to click on one of these pixels, you wouldn't just get a single value from low to high. Um, instead, you would get three values from low to high. And those three values would be representing your red band, your green band, and your blue band. So if you click on a pixel in here that looks relatively green, then you would expect that your green band is going to have a higher value, be brighter than your red and your blue. If I clicked on a place that's uh, that's looking more 
reddish or pinkish or something like that, then I would expect red to be higher than green and blue. But again, even in the case where you've got a three bands that you're looking at uh, to create color, um, you're still just dealing with numbers. What do raster data set look like in Arc Pro? Um, you will, so first, they don't actually look like this. This is just a grid of numbers. Um, but just to re reinforce again that point that all that you find in a, in a raster grid are a bunch of different numeric values. They could be integers like this, or they could be other things. When you go into Arc Pro catalog, uh, you will see a raster grid symbolized by this sort of grid feature on here. They might be different colors depending on whether you're in your geo database or outside of a geo database or depending on the data format, but ultimately anything that looks gritty uh, like that or like a foggy window in prison, <laughs> I think is what it looks like. Uh, that gives you, um, that lets you know that you're dealing with a raster data set. Raster data set, as we've talked about before, are all made up of pixels. Um, and pixels are always square. So each of those pixels has a value assigned to it, right? So if I explored over this pixel and I clicked on it, I might get a value of zero or 52 or 5 million or 3.14. Any of those would be possible for this pixel. Pixels are always square and they're always a specific size. So typically when we refer to pixels, we refer to them as just the length of one axis. So either the X axis or the Y axis. So for example, this would be referred to as a 10 meter pixel size. What's the area of a 10 meter pixel, right? So to get the area of a 10 meter pixel, you know that because it's square, it must be 10 by 10 or 100 square meters is the actual area of this pixel. And how do you find that? Well, in some cases, you're going to be creating raster data yourself. So you're going to have to remember to put in the specific cell size that you're looking for. Um, but if you're not sure what the cell size is, that's in your source tab. So we're familiar with source tab because we spent some quality time there looking at uh, um, projection information. There's also a drop down for raster data that's called raster information in your source tab. Um, and so in here, you can find how big the raster data set is. So this particular one um, was 869 by 875 pixels. It was just a single band image, so grayscale, you know, uh, essentially like doesn't have a red, green, and blue band. Gives you some other information. It's a 32 bit. Um, floating point pixels. So I could have values in there that, uh, you know, of stuff like 3.14, keep going back to that number because it's the only one in my head. When you look up here, you can see the cell size on here. X is 10, Y is 10. How do we know what the units of those are? We know what the units of, of those are if we scrolled up, if I were able to scroll up um, to the um, projection information whatever your linear distance unit is, is what this, the units of this. So generally from here on out, we're gonna be working in uh, data sets that are units of meters. Uh, we're doing a lot in um, you know, UTM or state plane projections in units of meters. So for the most part, it's a safe assumption that this is gonna be units of meters. One key thing that you've spent a lot of time doing with polygon data is calculating geometry, right? So you know that if you want to know the area of a certain polygon feature, you need to add a field uh, and call it area of in square meters or square kilometers, whatever you're calculating, calculate geometry to add that information in. That doesn't happen in raster data sets because again, raster data sets are just a set of numbers. So if you open the attribute table of a raster data set, you don't get a whole bunch of fields. You just get a row of frequency of the different pixel values um, that's, that's in there. So you, the attribute table of a raster data set is not particularly useful because it doesn't have attributes. It's just numbers. So that leads us to this question of, okay, well, if I can't do calculate geometry the way I remember with polygon data, how do I actually do that? 
The good thing is, since pixels are all square and you can tell that the area of this pixel is 100 square meters, then if you have a feature um, where you have a bunch of ones, where one is defined as true, one means suitable habitat for your critter, for example. You can, this is where the attribute table actually is handy for raster data, you can open that attribute table, look at the count of how many pixels, so you get number of pixels, and then you know the area of a single pixel. So anytime you're calculating area in raster, we're doing it with just this simple multiplication, <laughs> basically the area of one pixel times the number of pixels. Pixel size, when you're trying to calculate something like suitable land area or something like that, pixel size matters. So in vector space, let's say I created this buffer, right? In, in raster space, let's say there was a road in here that I created this buffer around. In raster space, I can create a distance grid away from that same road. But if I make it a very coarse pixel resolution like this one, then I'm gonna miss some area, right? So like whatever's going on right here at the corner of these two, where these two pixels are intersection, intersecting, that's underestimating my actual you know, buffer around this road. So higher resolution helps to be closer to the, the actual buffer distance. Challenge though, there's always a trade-off. Higher resolution takes the computer more memory, lower resolution takes the computer less memory. Um, polygons, because they have a whole bunch of attributes, tend to take more memory than either of these things, unless you absolutely go nuts with super high resolution raster. So generally, raster is preferable in terms of memory saving to vector, coarser resolution, or as coarse as seems reasonable, um, there's not a rule of thumb for that, whatever you eyeball and seems reasonable to you. Um, coarser resolution takes less memory than finer resolution. So why don't we go around using meter squared, right? These super high resolution data sets. So this is sort of a zoom in of a couple of remote sensing data sets for the city of Providence, Rhode Island. So here's one that's pretty high resolution. Here's the same thing, but pretty coarse resolution. So one of the big reasons is, you know, uh, it takes a lot of memory to go to meter or submeter resolution of, you know, everything on Earth. Um, and that's memory not only for the computers that you're working on these labs, but it's also memory for the satellites that are up there taking these images and the download speed of um, broadcasting those data back down to Earth so that we can use them. Uh, you know, the higher resolution you go, the more sort of memory expensive it gets. We're headed in that direction, you know, memory is getting cheaper and cheaper. And so eventually maybe we will be at the point where the entire earth, uh, you know, meter squared resolution is available to, available to us every day. Um, but we're not quite there yet. And most of the, especially when you look at older imagery maps uh, from satellite, they are coarser and coarser resolution, largely because there just wasn't enough memory um, to handle archive, you know, like to handle collection of high resolution data. What are some advantages of raster data? Um, well, one nice thing is that they're a surface. So every location within the raster extents, so the raster extents being, you know, a rectangle shape of, made up of all of these square pixels, could be a square shape too. Um, but it's always going to be at least some sort of rectangle. Every location in there has a pixel value. That value could be one, it could be zero, it could be a million, it could be, you know, 5.26, or it could be no data in some cases, but you will have information throughout. So that's different from, for example, having points, right? So I could have a point um, measurement here and a point measurement here, and I don't have any information between those two points. Uh, raster data, you'll always have information across that area. I mentioned this before, raster data typically are a smaller file size than shape files uh, of those similar features. So you lose attributes, but you gain uh, fleeter <laughs> data analysis because your data are smaller. So that's an advantage. 
Um, as long as you're not zoomed into that pixel resolution, raster data tend to look nice on a map. They make for a good base map, for example. So aerial imagery, remotely sensed data, topographic data, hill shades make for nice backgrounds because they give context of the general area uh, and because they're continuous across that area. Disadvantages. Uh, so we remember this from the lab four when we were talking about projections. If you change the projection of raster data, you actually degrade the data. You change the data themselves because pixels have shape, they're square, they have area, they're square. <laughs> uh, you can measure distance across a pixel, they have a uh, direction. All of those things are dis distorted. So if you uh, have a native resolution like this and you visualize it, so this is just visualizing it into a new um, projection, these are no longer square, right? They're cockeyed a little bit. They're kind of diamond shaped. And so if you wanted, G if you told GIS now make these square again, then GIS would sort of draw a square on top of each of these pseudo diamond shaped things so that up would still be, um, you know, where it's supposed to be. And so that you'd maintain a square here. This is not exactly the same, obviously it's tilted, right? It's not the same shape um, as this pixel. And so you end up with de uh, degradation or and data loss. And so if I went, uh, if I project, projected into a new projection and then projected again back to my original projection and you compared those two, the start and your end, even if they're in the same projection, you will not see the same exact uh, data if you clicked around on the pixels. So be cautious <laughs> about projecting um, your raster data sets. Another disadvantage is if you zoom way in, you start to see weird pixels and that does not look so good on a map, right? Um, especially if you're using coarse resolution data, um, they start to look pixelated as you zoom in to finer resolutions. And so, you know, base maps might look good if you're showing the whole state of Massachusetts, but might look less nice if you're zoomed in on, you know, one particular forest plot. What are the types of raster data? So two main types of raster data. One is continuous data. So continuous means that it has zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, 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 you know, like numbers. It could be zero, one, just zero, one, two, or zero, one, two, three, four, I suppose, could be continuous data. But typically they are things like topography. So you have topography going everywhere from sea level. This is a topographic map of some mountain range somewhere. Um, you know, you have sea level all the way up to uh, however high <laughs> Mount Everest is in meters, um, several kilometers off of, uh, off of sea level. Satellite imagery are another example of continuous data. So those are ones where you would typically have, um, especially if you're dealing with reflectance data, you might have everything from very dark, uh, like water, oceans, to very bright, um, like uh, the rooftop of Walmart kind of thing on a sunny day. Um, and those are continuous data, could be integers, could be floating point from zero to what have you. Continuous data could also be distance grids. So you could say, here is my road, and I'm going to create a grid of how far away I am from roads in Massachusetts. Um, and that would go everywhere from zero, I'm standing in the middle of a road <laughs> about to get hit by a truck to however, whatever the furthest distance is from a, from a road in Massachusetts, which is not as far as you would think. Discrete data. Uh, tend to be things that are classified. So that is, they are not necessarily the sort of original measurement of something, but they are those original measurements turned into a map, for example. So one real common form of discrete data is binary data. So binary is just a fancy word for saying zeros and ones. So any data set that's made up of just zeros and ones, we could refer to it as binary, we could refer to it as discrete, um, either of those is fine. Zeros and ones are a real common output when we're dealing with raster analysis um, and 
the spatial spatial analysts, I, I had that at the beginning, but spatial analyst is essentially the, the toolbox name for dealing with raster data. So spatial analyst is, um, you know, when we're dealing with this sort of spatial analysis of raster data, binary is super common. And typically what binary means, the way that it gets interpreted, and this is by through GIS, uh, but you should be thinking about this as sort of like a way to get to habitat suitability or not just habitat, any sort of suitability. But the way that we generally think of it is one means true. Yes, the animal could live there. Yes, this is a good site for a new stop and shop, you know, anything like that. Zero means false. So no, the animal cannot live there. No, this is not it's the middle of a swamp. It's not good site for a new stop and shop. So if you can think in terms of those binary numbers where one means true and zero means false and kind of get that uh, rolling around in your head a little bit, then you'll have a much easier time thinking through uh, the raster calculator and our sort of map algebra that we're going to get to in a minute. Discrete could also be a limited number of values. So this could be, you know, low to high. Low to high could be low to high topography, um, but it also could be low to high suitability for your critter, low to high suitability for the stop and shop, as you wish. Examples of discrete land cover, uh, sorry, discrete data sets include land cover. Um, so land cover is a common one where you would have a patch that is forest and a patch that is residential and a patch that is grassland kind of thing. Um, they are also quite commonly types of suitability analyses. Suitability analyses could be binary, so they could be good habitat, no habitat kind of thing, or habitat, no habitat. That would be a binary um, suitability. Or they could be however many discrete categories you wanted to describe your habitat. You know, zero is terrible, 52 is amazing, and I have all these numbers in between to, to illustrate a gradient between terrible and amazing. So you can always, there is a reclassify tool, so you can always change your continuous data into discrete. You can never <laughs> change your discrete data back to continuous. So all of those like spy movies that you see where they take this like terrible pixelated image and they're like enhanced and somehow it becomes somebody's face. No, not a thing that I, it actually happens at least uh, maybe in the military, but at least it does not happen in, uh, in raster space and GIS. Some analysis tools that you have done before and their uh, compadres, I guess, in, um, in raster space. So in vector, an vector analysis and ge uh, vector geoprocessing, you have a buffer, which gives you a distance, a set distance that you define away from a feature like this road. In raster analysis, this is called Euclidean distance. And Euclidean distance, essentially, um, rather than giving you sort of a single shape around that road, it instead gives you a continuous distance far from the road, close to the road kind of thing. You'll notice here that this particular raster grid is cut off at the edges of where my road is, right? Like it goes to this edge of the road, that edge of the road over here and down here, and that, defi that is defining this rectangle. That is something that you can change, but it's worth noting in raster analysis that you need to figure out sort of ahead of time, how big do I want this? If I'm creating a distance grid, how big do I want it to be? And then make sure that you tell <laughs> GIS, that's how big you want it to be. Um, I should go back one, one and say, you also, when you're creating a distance grid, have the option of dis defining the pixel size in here, right? So I can make these, 100 meter pixels, or I could make them 10 centimeter pixels. Hopefully, you'll do neither of those things. Uh, you know, hopefully, if this whole area is, uh, you know, um, a couple of square kilometers, then aiming for something that's, you know, 10, 20 meter pixel size, um, then that's sort of reasonable as far as encompassing. 
this is one of those things, pixel size is one of those things that you just have to do a little trial and error, you know? So if GIS is spending 10 minutes processing your pix your new Euclidean distance grid, it may be because you chose a very fine pixel resolution and or a very large area for it to create that distance grid. Um, so you uh, get get better sense of this after you've messed up a few times. And I definitely have. Another form of raster analysis that we haven't done any of in vector space is surface analysis. So these are essentially topography features. So if you have a, a topographic map, so that is a digital elevation model, that's what DEM stands for, right? Then you can, with that, create a hill shade, which is a shaded relief map, right? One of those things that we saw way in the beginning. You can create a slope map, which tells you the uh, degree that uh, this of slope of each of those pixels based on your topographic map. You can create an aspect surface. So aspect is essentially what direction is this slope facing? Is it north facing, south facing? That goes on a whole circle, zero to 360 degrees, zero is north. And then there's a bunch of other things that you can do too, like you could make contour lines, um, whatever these other things do. Uh, oh, I, this is my only animation for the whole semester, so I hope you enjoy this. You can also overlay, so we can use a little transparency and put one of those hill shades underneath uh, a topographic map to give it a little bit more pop and context as, uh, as your base map. Um, and then raster calculator is probably the, the tool that takes, takes everybody a little time to kind of wrap your head around how this works. But raster calculator is essentially where you do math uh, on your raster grids. So the calculator is uh, pretty simple in the sense that, you know, just, uh, I can't remember what other tools you've done this for, but you know, you double click on this, to get your raster layer in here. And then I could just say, okay, add 12 to the, if I wanted to add 12. I don't know why I would, honestly, but you know, you can add 12, you can divide by 32, whatever it is that you want to do to that grid. Um, so you can use those basic operators, a plus or a multiply, or I would say the two most common ones that I use, or you can use what are called Boolean operators, ands and or statements to combine different raster grids. Um, so one of those basic things, right, is just like adding numbers to your grid if you wanted to do that for whatever reason. But if we want to think in terms of what we've done before in vector analysis of intersects or clips, right, which remember gives you the intersection, the area that overlaps between those two vector features. The equivalent of that in raster land is an AND statement. So this is called a Boolean operator. And an AND statement is using the ampersand in raster calculator. Um, so you can either uh, use this Boolean AND or you could multiply the two rasters together if they're, bi if they're binary um, so that you can get these intersects and erases. And I'm going pretty fast through this. You're going to get more practice with this in, uh, in lab of using ands, using multiplies. But essentially what this is, is let's say raster one is a bunch of ones and zeros, where one is true, that's suitable, and zero is false. And let's say raster two is also a bunch of ones and zeros, where one is true and zero is false. If I use an and statement here, um, then what GIS is going to do, and we also have to assume, well, we don't, we don't have to assume, we should ideally have created these two rasters so that they overlap each other perfectly, right? So that it's really easy for GIS to say this pixel in raster one is the same location and extents as the same pixel in raster two. So if I use something like an and statement, then what GIS does is it looks through and it says, okay, in raster one, is the value true? Or is the value not false, I guess is the better way to say that. So if the value is zero, then it's like, nope, that is not true. If the value is 35, then that could be true. You know, it, it's non-zero basically. So if raster one value is 35 and raster two value is one, 
then GIS looks at those and says, neither of these are false, neither of these are zero, therefore I'm gonna give you an output of true. But remember, true is one. So if you have raster 135, raster 2, one, then the output raster grid for that pixel is gonna be one, true. Let's say in another pixel you have 35 in raster one and zero in raster two, then GIS is gonna look at that and say, one of those is false. They are both not true. <laughs> both of them are not true. One of them is false. And therefore I'm gonna give you an output zero of false. Remember false is zero. So the output of this, this raster three, is going to give you ones and zeros, where ones are both of these rasters are true, and zeros are either or both of these rasters are false. Here's the, uh, another snapshot just to look at that. Um, so for example, one and zero is zero. One and one is one. Both of those are true. Zero and zero, definitely zero. Uh, four and three, neither of those is false, right? Therefore it's true. The other thing to look out for though, which is shown in here are no data values. Um, sometimes we end up with no data values. For example, if you've created a distance grid and uh, reclassified it and ended up with some no data values outside of your sort of true um, area far or close to the roads. Anytime you multiply no data values by anything, four times no four and no data is going to give you no data. So watch out for that. Watch out for no data. Um, it's always, I'd say, generally advisable to if you're trying to um, combine different raster, raster data sets to think about whether you actually have no data or if those data should just be marked as false zero can always reclassify. It's a tool you're going to spend some time with. Um, there's another vector analysis that we didn't actually spend any time on, but was mentioned uh, in your geoprocessing, which is a union. And this is one where you're looking at the overlap of all of these things. So let's say, for example, you have a habitat suitability where you're saying this, uh, this species can exist either in a rectangle or in a circle, right? So I don't just want the area of rectangle and circle, I actually want area of both rectangle and circle. If you're doing this with um, polygons as a vector analysis, that would be a union. In raster analysis, this is an or statement. So again, this Boolean or statement, and that's done by this vertical pipe. So and is an ampersand, or is the vertical pipe. So if I have raster one or raster two, then all I need to achieve is that either one of those or both of them is true to get an output of one equals true. So if raster one is 35 and raster two is zero, well, one of them is true. The other one doesn't have to be, so you'll get a value of true. The only place, the only time that you'll get a value of false, zero, is if both raster one and raster two are zero, because neither of those is true, and so the output is going to be false. So here's a way of looking at, at that. Um, so one or zero, are either of those true? Yes, this one is, so that's true. Um, zero or one, are either of those true? Yes, this one is, so that's an output of one. Zero or zero, are either of those true? Nope, neither of those is true, so I'm gonna get an output of zero. Just like with the and statement though, we will end up with no data problems if there are no data in either of your grids. So no data or three <laughs> does not give you a true, it gives you a no data. So watch out for no data um, in your raster grids. Um, you can also, of course, just do basic math in raster analysis, right? So you can do raster one plus raster two. So if I just have ones and zeros, where ones and zeros in raster one is one form of suitability, ones and zeros in raster two is another form of suitability. Um, if I add those together, then I will end up with zeros suitable in neither, ones suitable in one or the other, I don't know which one necessarily, or two is suitable in both. 
So if you're trying to get into that level of sort of categorical suitability, then adding things together might be a way to do it. If you think that both roster one, you know, roster one or roster two, so this is kind of the equivalent of an or statement, except that the output is gonna be the sum of all of your rasters rather than just a one zero. Multiplying is kind of the equivalent of an and statement. Um, where, except that your outputs are not necessarily just ones and zeros. They could be. So if my inputs are ones and zeros, and I say, you know, raster one, I have a value of one equals true. Raster two, I have a value of, uh, you know, also one equals true. If I multiply those together, one times one equals one, right? zero times zero is zero, but zero times one is gonna give you zero. So that will just isolate the locations where it is true in both, very similar to an and statement, except that you know if I wanted to, I could have a bunch of different values for raster one, like they could be five, six, seven, and raster two could be zeros and ones. And when I multiplied them together, then I would essentially zero out all of the five, six, and sevens that had a zero value in roster two and just end up with the overlap um, while retaining my five sixes and sevens from roster one. Hopefully this is all gonna gel a little bit, make a little bit more sense once you've dug in and had a chance to play around with some of this raster calculation. All right, so the, let's see, the last thing that I wanna do is just to do a quick walkthrough then of the dead bird analysis with vector data set. And I'm actually gonna record this separately. So I'll post a, a separate um, walkthrough. You can find the, the link to that on Moodle. Thank you very much. Oops. <laughs>